I'd like to talk to you about the importance of healthy ageing and share with you some early ideas about the work of ageing better. I hope by the end you'll be convinced that healthy ageing is an important public health priority. I'm passionate about making the lives of other people better and particularly those who don't have the same advantages and opportunities that I enjoy. I'm really excited about the opportunity to be working on one of the most important issues that we face as a society, namely ageing. While many people today and in future will enjoy a good later life, this is not universal. Too many people still die prematurely, suffer from ill health or disability for much of their later life, experience poverty or financial insecurity, feel lonely and isolated, or lack meaning and purpose in their lives. Aging is still often seen as a problem rather than an opportunity for society and for individuals. A lot of the focus of statutory services is necessarily on those people who are ill, have multiple comorbidities or are at or near the end of life. As public spending becomes tighter, there's a tendency to target the most needy, the most critical and the most urgent. Prevention and early intervention are often deprioritised. As an organisation, Ageing Better will be seeking to gather evidence and support changes that help people prepare better for later life and ensure that fewer people in future miss out on a good later life. The challenge, as with other areas of prevention, is making the case for why this is important. While the economic case is important, I also want to say that we must not forget the moral case too. I want to talk about why healthy ageing matters. I suppose the first thing to say is that the fact that we're on average living longer is a great triumph of public health and healthcare. Projections of life expectancy have needed to be regularly revised upwards over the last decade or more as we've outlived the expectations of actuaries and others. Combined with the demographic age profile of the population, we're experiencing a rapid growth in the proportion of the population over 65 and indeed over 85 as the baby boomer generation reach retirement age. People aged 65 years and older will exceed 15 million by 2031 and around half of those will be 75 years and older. But success comes at a price, particularly for the public purse. There's more public expenditure on average for those over 65 as this slide shows. It's a combination of pensions, shown in yellow, health, shown in orange, and social care, shown in green. So it matters to the government and particularly to the Treasury. And it also matters to all of us as taxpayers. The red line shows the tax contributions of people at different ages and shows that those in the middle years contribute most. There's been a growing debate about intergenerational distribution, with welfare cuts hitting working families hardest and the triple lock protecting pensioners. So with the numbers of people over 65 set to rise in absolute terms and the rise in age dependency ratios, that is a higher ratio of people over 65 to working age adults, projections are that we will be spending a higher proportion of our GDP on health and social care in future. So there does seem to be a public expenditure argument for healthy ageing, if it means less disease and disability. So what do we know about ageing better and what makes for a good later life? Most people over the age of 65 are just getting on living their lives as best they can under the circumstances they find themselves in. I was going through my father-in-law's things shortly after he'd died and found a copy of a form he'd filled out for a local integrated care pilot. He was asked to state the three most important goals. This is what he wrote. To remain healthy for as long as possible, to remain active for as long as possible, and to be useful for as long as possible. Prevention in the ageing context is about helping people like my father-in-law and future generations to stay as well, as active, as independent and connected for as long as possible. Qualitative research with older people and analysis of survey data from the English Longitudinal Survey on Ageing suggests there are three fundamental aspects to a good later life. Good health, financial security and social connections. I want to now say a little bit about each of these. The World Health Organization has defined healthy ageing as the process of developing and maintaining the functional ability that enables well-being in older age. While longer life is to be celebrated, if more of these extra years are lived in poor health or with disability, then the implications for older people and society may be more negative. 
Certainly not everyone enjoys a healthy later life. There is a growing diversity in the experience of ageing well. Michael Marmot shows this starkly in this figure. While on average people can expect to live to age 77, 15 of these years are spent with some form of disability. The difference in disability free life expectancy between the wealthier neighbourhoods in England and those living in poorer neighbourhoods is 13 years. So people living in poorer areas not only die sooner, but they also spend more of their shorter lives with disability. And poorer areas often lack the infrastructure and resources that might enable someone with restricted capacity to do what they need to do. But poor health does not have to be an inevitable part of ageing. Most of the health problems of older age are the result of chronic diseases. Many of these can be prevented or delayed by engaging in healthy behaviours. Michael Marmot's work on inequalities shows the importance of taking a life course approach. Healthy behaviours are important at any stage in life, and healthy ageing is ultimately the culmination of a lifetime's risk factors. Yet even in very advanced years, physical activity and good nutrition can have powerful benefits for health and well-being. One area where there appears to be a particular opportunity is physical activity. Data suggests that there is a rapid decline in physical activity at older ages and a huge gap between age-specific guidelines and activity levels. Sedentary behaviour increases with age overall and is more pronounced in routine or manual households than those in professional or managerial households. Physical inactivity is responsible for one in six of deaths in the UK, making sedentary lifestyles as dangerous as smoking, according to Public Health England. The good news is that there is evidence that physical activity interventions are cost-effective, according to NICE. So there's a huge opportunity to promote health by increasing physical activity levels at older ages, as well as delaying the onset of ill health and disability, particularly amongst lower socioeconomic groups. I'll return to this last point as we turn to the second of the three dimensions of a good later life, money. Again, there is cause for celebration. Poverty in old age has declined rapidly and there are more older homeowners than ever before. However, again, there are inequalities. Many older people report only just having enough money to get by and are vulnerable to shocks to their finances, for example, widowhood or unexpected care needs. Older people are vulnerable to deaths from cold as well as heat. Fuel poverty and poor housing conditions are key risk factors. Older people in poverty are also more likely to have poor nutrition, meaning they are likely to have a slower or poorer recovery from illness. So what might be done to help more people enter old age with greater financial security? Key to this will be better planning, higher savings and longer working lives. While 60% believe that they are mainly responsible for ensuring sufficient retirement income, some 30% think it's government's responsibility. And the situation looks challenging. Nearly 40% of people agreeing that there won't be a state pension by the time they retire. Despite this, a third of people say they would choose a good standard of living today over saving for retirement. There's clearly more to be done to help people save and plan for the future. The alternative is that people will have to work for longer. We know that ill health is a key reason why people become economically inactive before state pension age. Staying in work for longer, particularly meaningful or higher quality work, increases people's likelihood of having financial savings and pensions and also has wider benefits. For example, remaining active, having a sense of purpose, and it's positive for both physical and mental health. There are, of course, wider economic benefits too. Extending average working life by one year could increase GDP by 1%. That's equivalent to about £18 billion per year. However, those most likely to stay in work longer are those who are in professional jobs. A higher proportion of lower skilled workers work out of necessity, but many believe they are unable to. The challenge here is for employers to retain, recruit and retrain older workers, as well as those organisations supporting people into work. So wider determinants, including material conditions, are important to a good later life. It's not always easy, though, to know what actions work to address these issues. This is something that Ageing Better will want to help address. I'd now like to turn to the final of the three elements of a good later life, social connections. 
While sufficient levels of health and money are important to enable people to get on with their lives, it's possible to have both health and money and not be happy. You may say that's fairly obvious. But evidence suggests the key difference are social relationships, that is, being connected to others. It is through these relationships that we derive our sense of purpose and value as a person. It's great that there's a policy and practice focus on loneliness and how to reduce it. It's a key public health concern. I personally prefer a more positive framing, focused on building and maintaining social connections. The Institute of Health Equity and Public Health England defined social isolation as the inadequate quality and quantity of social relations with other people at the different levels where human interaction takes place. Older people make a huge contribution to society in many ways, within their family, for example caring for grandchildren or a spouse, to their local community and to society more broadly. However, our ability to contribute heavily depends on our health. If people are in good health, they're able to do the things they value with few limitations. The lack of health and money may be a barrier to older people contributing to their communities and having and maintaining social relationships. Risk factors for social isolation in later life include bereavement, loss of mobility, poor housing and being a carer. Men are more at risk than women. One study found that lack of social connections was a key predictor of hospital admission, care home admission and mortality. Small acts of kindness, neighbourliness and engaging people in groups in communities and perhaps virtually too could make a big difference in tackling social isolation and building social connections. While there is still a job to be done to add health to years, there's a much wider challenge to public health to support more people to enjoy a good later life. This will mean addressing issues as diverse as housing conditions, worklessness, fuel poverty, community participation, bereavement and carer support, adaptable housing and supportive urban design. Local authorities are well placed to address these issues holistically, working with community partners. Public health can play a leading role. I hope you will work with us to build a society in which more people are able to enjoy a good later life. Thank you.